see that right there. Mm. You see this? There you go. Perfect. So I think we're gonna start up. It's a 603. I think some more people will will slowly come in. Um, but just to, to go over a few housekeeping uh, little bits, my name is Willa Arsenal. I'm here representing the Nantucket Land and Water Council. I'm the Environmental Program Coordinator. Um, so this Zoom is being recorded. It's going to be posted onto the Nantucket Land and Water Council's website later on. Um, just so you know, before you ask any personal questions, just keep that in mind because we're going to have this in a public setting. Um, as people come in, we're going to get started with a pretty exciting presentation. We're really thrilled to have this happening. Um, as many of you know, the Nantucket Land and Water Council is a local nonprofit where uh, our mission is to protect the, the health of Nantucket's environment and the community through the preservation of its land and water resources. So this collaboration tonight is, is really thrilling and we're looking forward to the presenters that we're going to have happening or speaking tonight. Um, as we move through this presentation, it's gonna be about an hour of, uh, of speakers, and then we're gonna have 30 minutes at the end for Q&A, give or take. Um, so you, if you have any questions, you can feel free to use the hand raise uh, function at the bottom of your screen. And I will sort of call on people as I, as I see hands raised. You can also enter questions into the chat and I'll try and voice those to the speakers as well. So I believe we're gonna, I'm gonna to jump to Aisha and I'm going to just share my screen and we can get started. Hi, I'm Aisha from Nantucket PFAS Action Group. Thank you again. Thank you, Willa. And thank you to everybody who's joined. Um, welcome to our webinar, a, P a Conversation in PFAS. This session is designed to equip the public with critical information, enabling all to make informed decisions regarding PFAS contamination and its impact on health and the environment. We hope to foster a dialogue between experts and the public to encourage proactive measures in addressing PFAS contamination. We welcome our esteemed panelists. Thank you all for joining and thank them for their invaluable contributions to this important conversation. Uh, today, we are joined by a panel of experts whose diverse backgrounds and relentless dedication to combating PFAS pollution have led to significant adv advancements in the field. We have three panel presenters today, Dr. Courtney Kerrigan, followed by Kristen Mello, and then followed by Dr. Lepre. Dr. Courtney Kerrigan is an assistant professor at Michigan State University who investigates exposure to environmental contaminants and impacts on reproductive and child health. She has 20 years of experience in environmental public health and a strong record for translating research into public health action. Over the past decade, her research has focused primarily on PFAS exposures and health effects in pregnant women and children communities with drinking water contamination and firefighters. She also co-leads the PFAS Exchange website and biannual National PFAS Conference. A New Hampshire native, Dr. Kerrigan received her PhD in environmental health from Boston University School of Public Health and completed her postdoctoral training at Dartmouth College and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Without further ado, let's delve into a productive discussion on how we can collectively navigate the challenges posed by PFAS contamination. Courtney, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Aisha. Somebody needs to enable my screen sharing. Is that? If you possible? should be able to now. Okay. okay. All right. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You can hear me okay? All right, move some things around. All right, thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna leave my camera off if that's okay because I've got a sick kiddo on my lap. Uh, but um, I didn't wanna miss this. Um, I've been working with Aisha for years now and I'm really pleased to be able to chat with you all tonight. So, um, you know, I first got involved working with Aisha um, after the PFAS contamination was discovered on Nantucket. I provide technical support for communities um, with PFAS contamination for free, and we sort of connected that way. And then Aisha had questions about um, firefighter exposure, and that led us to develop this project together. So I was out in Nantucket two years ago now uh, conducting this study, uh, the firefighter turnout gear PFAS study. 
in uh, yeah so these are just photos from that I wanted to start with just to say that I really enjoyed visiting the island and working with the fire department and the Nantucket PFAS Action Group and Aisha and I got to meet Dr. Lepre when I was there as well. So let's talk about PFAS. So PFAS is our um, a class of a large class of highly fluoridated um, chemicals that have been termed forever chemicals because of their extreme persistence. And they include over 12,000 different chemicals. The most well studied of them are the C8s, so like PF, uh, PFOS and PFOA. They're called C8 because they have eight carbons on this carbon fluorine chain, and the bond between the carbon and fluorine is very, very strong, right? So that's they don't degrade very easily. Um, these were phased out of use over a decade ago, and so you're going to hear me calling these legacy PFASs. And then hundreds of other PFASs with fewer carbons are currently in use, and there's mounting evidence that these chemical cousins are also harmful. Um, one thing to know about PFASs is they really don't stay put. They move around and with the water cycle. So I like this figure because it does a nice job of showing all of some of the different ways that PFASs can move in the environment. And so this is one of the reasons that um, they get into groundwater and uh, can get into drinking water, as you all now know. <laughs> because of their extreme persistence and widespread use, PFASs are transported all over the world. They accumulate in polar regions and they bioaccumulate up the food chain. Fish and marine mammals contain some of the highest levels that have been measured in wildlife. PFASs are in everyone's bodies because of their widespread use. They mainly enter our bodies by ingesting food and water, um, as well as air, dust, and um, consumer products. It's difficult for our bodies to eliminate PFASs. Our kidneys mistake them as useful and reabsorb them. Um, they, we are born exposed, so babies are born with at least as much PFAS as their mothers and are further exposed to breast milk. And this is especially concerning because we know that pregnancy and early life are particularly sensitive to um, chemicals like this. Of the hundreds of studies on health effects, almost all have focused on PFOA and PFOS, which are historically the most prevalent. They've been found to affect multiple systems in the body and have been linked with a wide array of health concerns, including high cholesterol, immune effects, decreased infant and fetal growth, certain cancers, including kidney, testicular, and breast cancer, pregnancy-induced hypertension, thyroid disease and dysfunction, and autoimmune disease. So I'm gonna talk a little bit later about um, levels in blood, and um, we can also talk about levels in water, what is high. So just know that you know, in one of the more highly exposed communities that was studied, um, you know, a lot of these links were found. And um, just because something's been linked with a health outcome doesn't mean you're gonna get it. So I sort of rattle off this list and it's, it's a kind of a scary list, um, but it doesn't mean that you are going to get it. Everybody has different risk factors. There are a lot of factors involved. And so as I get through the presentation, I'm gonna hear more about um, things that, you know, ways that you can use this list to, to help be proactive about your health. So. You know, people who smoke have an increased list of lung, lung cancer, but then there's always people who never get it. Um, and so this can sort of be put onto a medical record as like a risk factor like you might do for smoking um, and used to, uh, in, you know, help, help you protect your health, basically. So over seven years ago, I contributed to a study that estimated over 6 million Americans have been served by drinking water systems containing elevated concentrations of PFASs. And this estimate since risen to over 110 million um, people people with detectable PFASs in their water. Um, and I think there's you know, ongoing research in this area, but water contamination was likely, uh, was more likely near industrial sites manufacturing PFAS, wastewater treatment plants, since they receive waste from industries using PFAS. And most relevant to firefighters, um, sorry, this is a firefighter talk, uh, military fire training areas and AFFF certified airports. And um, that's likely due to their use and aqueous film forming foams, which are used to fight fuel fires. So that's the source of um, some of the water contamination on Nantucket. So the military in some states have started testing for PFAS. This map shows where drinking water has been tested. So when you look at the clusters, basically it's showing you where PFAS testing is happening. Um, and you can see that some states um, are not testing and other states are testing much more. 
if EPA promulgates the proposed enforceable federal drinking water standards, M the MCLs, um, this will help there be more equitable testing and treatment of drinking water systems across the country. So I first got involved with PFAS about a decade ago. I was living in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, I'm a New Hampshire native. And this contamination was discovered um, related to AFFF use at the former Air Force Base. Um, and yeah, <laughs> this is how I first got involved. And, and there are a lot of sites, uh, sites like this uh, across the United, United States and across the world. Uh, another one here in Michigan, uh, so I've been in Michigan for seven years now, is the Wurt Smith former Air Force Base. And this was discovered um, even longer ago, I think, you know, 12 or 15 years ago. And some, some things to note about this, there's been a lot of research done at Wordsmith, and I'm just sort of notice, noting it. Um, they have a fish advisory because of the um, PFAS has migrated into the marsh adjacent and into the river adjacent, the lake adjacent, and even to Lake Huron. Um, so that's that fish advisory there. There's also a do not eat deer advisory, um, and there's a do not eat, do not touch the foam. So the PFAS is, they like to hang out at the air water interface and um, they'll accumulate in surface water foam. So the levels of PFAS in the surface water foam in this lake that has this um, pretty high PFAS contamination, the foam is very, very high in PFASs. Um, and these are some, some examples of how PFASs at Wordsmith were released um, into these big airplane hangars. And so the amount of PFAS that was released was really, really large. Uh, and this was just sort of um, swept out into, out the, you know, out the hangar door and just allowed to go out in the environment because uh, firefighters were told that it was like soap and water and they handled and disposed of it as if it was not hazardous. And so, um, you know, firefighters have some of the highest levels, the, the ones that uh, handle PFAS and used it a lot. Uh, we can see some pretty high levels in firefighters comparable to what we see in people with notable drinking water contamination. So um, I'm sharing this because just I think it's useful um, way to, these numbers are a little outdated, but basically what it's showing you is that, you know, the general population, their PFAS exposure is primarily coming through diet. So here's the dose that you would, uh, total dose of PFAS, and you can see most of that dose is coming from diet. So if we look at this number, uh, we go over here and we've got a little bit higher level. This is uh, with a little bit of drinking water uh, contamination. And so you can see that that drinking water exposure um, becomes a bigger part of the pie. So this is more exposures coming from drinking water. And if that number goes up even higher, um, we see that number uh, continue to grow. I feel like I might have an animation here. I do, okay, here we go. So here's the low water. Uh, this is one around one part per trillion, around 40 parts per trillion. And this one's getting up uh, in the you know 500 parts per trillion. And like I said, these numbers are a little outdated, but to give you sort of an idea about what we think of as low, you know, moderate and high. Um, and this is a person who uh, was working in a facility that's using PFAS, and you can see that their exposure is very, very high, and it just really dwarfs everything else. So, you know, we do a lot of PFAS blood testing. Um, there are two main benefits of this. This helps people understand and mitigate their personal exposures. So if we, you know, uh, stop the drinking water exposure pathway, we put a filter on or we switch the water source, uh, we would expect the level to come down over time. How fast it comes down depends on the PFAS and it depends on the person. Um, sorry, sick kid. Um, and so, but but there there are ways to predict that, and and you sh you know monitoring it over time can help you make sure it's coming down. Um, and then they can also share it with their doctor as a risk factor and consider medical screening. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So we have some tools. Um, I just wanted to share this screenshot of it, but I'm gonna show you how to get there. So you can go to the PFAS Exchange website and um, navigate to the What's My Exposure tool, and you can enter your PFAS blood test results here and choose the correct units. Uh, it should be on whatever, uh, however it was reported, uh, or you can also do it for water. We have a separate place where you can put your water results in. And what that will do when you hit enter is it will uh, give you a readout and show you where you fall in relation to some benchmarks um, and as well as the you know, comparison population. So here the blue dots are all showing you um, people in sort of the general population from a big national survey that's done by the CDC. And uh, you can see that this person's a little bit above the, above most people, it's in the higher end, but it's you know not, a lot of the 
a lot of populations I work with are, are up, up over here. All right, so there's, there's where you can find them. What's my exposure tool on the PFAS exchange? Uh, we also have a resources tab, and that's what's shown here. We have a lot of different fact sheets that could be helpful. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about our medical screening guidance, or I'm going to tell you right now that we have a medical screening uh, companion guidance. So there's two fact sheets there. One is for people in PFAS impacted communities, and one is for clinicians. And so this can be useful um, in having conversations with you with your doctor. You guys have Dr. Lepre, he's very knowledgeable, but a lot of communities, especially when I started working on this 10 years ago, um, the people who were exposed that we were providing technical support to knew a lot more about PFAS than their doctor did. So um, they asked for these kinds of tools and have found them useful. We also developed this PFAS blood testing tool, um, uh, fact sheet, excuse me. And again, this was really in response to people who wanted blood testing, but weren't able to get it. Um, you know, you can get a, a doctor can order a lead test for blood, but it uh, wasn't at the time able to order a PFAS blood test. And that's that's changed. And that's part of uh, some of the work that Aisha's helped with is getting that changed. Um, we also have a connecting communities tab. And and I think people don't always tend to click on that, but there's a there's a kind of a neat map there. And it has things that you can click on to see where PFAS sites have been identified. Um, and so that can be handy as well. So just uh, looking at the PFAS blood testing fact sheet, just wanted to highlight this um, because this is really the information that your doctor needs. And I think we're working, uh, Aisha, again, kind of raised that, you know, this there's maybe a more useful way to get this information to, to doctors. So um, in the meantime, though, this is where it is. And these are the codes that doctors can use to order a PFAS blood test. There's also a new screen, uh, medical screening guidance, and I, I really like this figure. This is a, a little snip from a figure from this report from the National Academies on PFAS blood testing and health outcomes. And basically what it says is that if your blood test results for the four PFAS, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven PFASs shown kind of at the bottom there, uh, if the sum of those are over 20 nanograms per milliliter, so it's parts per billion, um, then you might consider, you know, you might talk with your doctor about getting some additional screening. So most of the screening that's recommended is essentially what you would get when you go um, go to your doctor for your um, annual checkup. And so these are just uh, some additional ones. And, and basically the other thing that the guidance says that can be useful to you and your doctor is that if you have a known or suspected elevated exposure, then that really warrants, um, you know, your right or um, I don't know if you're right is the is the word, but um, you know there could be benefits of getting uh, PFAS blood testing. Another thing that I've been working on again is trying to improve access to PFAS blood testing. Is um, there's a new tool that was developed to do self collection of blood. Uh, this actually kind of came out during the pandemic, and we were excited about this because you know people have had so much trouble getting access. And uh, we thought, you know, if people can self-collect at home, that will really improve access to this kind of testing. So uh, we did a study to look at that. So we enrolled people in a community with elevated exposure through drinking water. And we actually ended up with a nice spread. Um, <clears throat> these dots are showing you all the different levels in their blood using the traditional test. And this is this variation is actually because they had a wide variety of PFAS in their water along with the differences between people and how long they'd lived there and drank the water and differences in um, how, how frequently they drank the water. And um, so what you can see is this is basically a correlation. Um, this is a linear regression, but it's essentially a correlation. You might be more familiar with that term. And uh, it's just comparing the results from the test on this axis to the results from the traditional test. Um, and we did them at the same time in people's homes with the phlebotomist and with the uh, finger prick test. And you can see that they have very good agreement. Um, this is some of the best data, you know, I've ever seen in this, you know, in these kinds of studies. Um, and we also were able to calculate a conversion factor that can be used to convert from the whole blood, uh, the whole blood method to the traditional serum method. So you can compare with um, other studies that have used the more traditional approach. 
So, you know, there are limitations to blood tests. They don't predict a health effect. Uh, like I mentioned, everyone has a different underlying risk factors. Um, however, oh, sorry, not however. Um, and the other limitation is that blood tests for some PFASs may not be available. So like I mentioned, there's thousands of PFASs um, and not all of them um, may be able to be currently detected in blood just due to analytical limitations, um, but they are excreted at different rates uh, from the body. And so it also means that some of them may not be um, actually a good measure of what your exposure is. And this is something that I think about a lot. Um, it may not be super uh, useful for you right now, but it just seemed worth mentioning because AFFF uh, is, has a lot of different PFASs in it. And I work with a lot of people and especially chemists who are really interested in those mixtures and characterizing that. Um, and that has a lot of relevance to my, to my research and understanding health effects. So of course, like all researchers, you know, I think more research is needed. And I do a lot of work around biomonitoring studies, collecting information, uh, testing biobanking samples and things like that. So just wrapping up here, um, I like to tell people other things that they can do. Um, one thing that you can do is support health protective chemical policy. I often get questions about, you know, how does this happen? How do we end up with these bad chemicals in our environment? Why are they still being produced if we don't know that they're safe? Um, and that's a long answer. <laughs> I don't think it's the question that you all have asked right now, but, um, you know, that's, those answers are out there, and part of the answer is, is needing um, stronger chemical policy. We have a conference coming up. I just like plugging this conference and all my presentations right now. The National PFAS Conference is going to be in Ann Arbor, Michigan this June. So uh, I think Asia will be there, and uh, you could be there as well. So thank you to my collaborators. A lot of people work on the PFAS exchange um, and some of the tools that I mentioned. Um, including Eurofins um, had a central role in that PFAS blood testing tool that I mentioned. Sound terrible, honey. Okay, and my lab. Uh, this is this is the folks in my lab and our funders. Um, and thank all of you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and if anyone was having a hard time in the waiting room, apologies. I'm not sure if it's the storm, but there might be a little bit of a lag. So apologize if um, if you guys were in the waiting room for a while. Um, it will be recorded so you can catch up in the beginning. Unfortunately, I apologize. Sometimes with the storms, it just gets a little wacky. So next we'll have, um, and thank you, Dr. Kerrigan, uh, for your presentation. Next, we will have Ms. Kristen Mello. She has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in analytical chemistry, specializing in chemometrics. She is the director of Westfield Residents Advocating for Themselves, a community group formed in response to the PFAS contamination of Westfield's drinking water from AFFF use at Barnes Air National Guard, um, National Guard Base. Kristen served on the Mass DEP PFAS MCL stakeholder group, that's the max, uh, maximum contamination level, and her PFAS advocacy work played a pivotal role in her election as a Westfield City Councilor at large in 2019, 2021, and 2023. Thank you so much, and Kristen, I'll hand it off to you. Kristen, I do think you're muted, sorry. Thank you, Willa. Um, thank you so much, Aisha. And uh, I apologize, my dog has just had surgery and she's in a little bit of uh, discomfort. So I gave her some treats and we'll see how it goes. Um, so thank you to all of my collaborators and to the presenters tonight uh, and to everyone who has attended. My name is Kristen Mello and I am from Westfield. I was uh, not, acting as a chemist, but working as a stay-at-home auntie, taking care of my brother's kids, um, feeding them the water that had been contaminated when I found out it was contaminated. And uh, so this topic came to me through the tap. And um, I've been fighting for uh, Massachusetts residents and their drinking water ever since. So um, as Aisha said, uh, I was one of only two community members uh, stakeholders on the Massachusetts DEP maximum contaminant level stakeholders group. We fought for those positions. Uh, the other was um, 
Sue Phelan from Green Cape uh, out in Barnstable, Massachusetts. We fought very hard to get regulatory limits in the state of Massachusetts for PFAS in our drinking water. What we managed to achieve uh, was on the slide, the 20 parts per trillion limit for the sum of six PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, PFHPA, PFHXS, PFPA, just and went PFNA. Now, the thing about it is, is that the regulatory limits that Mass DEP has apply to all public drinking water supplies. Private drinking water supplies are regulated by Massachusetts Department of Public Health and local public health authorities. Mass DEP has, you know, no regulatory action over them. Um, but because this was such a big problem, and because PFAS are uh, persistent toxic bioaccumulative compounds, Mass DEP took a stand. Uh, next slide, please, Willow. And offered private well testing for uh, residents in Massachusetts whose communities um, were primarily serviced by private wells and Nantucket was one of them. So Mass, Mass DEP came out and um, did some private well testing as they did in other communities in Massachusetts. Next slide, please. Uh, now we know from EWG and from Mass DEP waste site information and from town on island testimony uh, that there are some areas of interest on Nantucket where we think that PFAS has been used and may or may not be affecting the water supply. Next slide, please. So in all, the Mass DEP private well testing on Nantucket tested 41 private wells. 27 were listed as non-detect for the PFAS-6. Put a pin in that, we're gonna come back to that, non-detect, those are in air quotes. Nine out of the 41 wells tested were above 10 parts per trillion for the sum of the PFAS-6. One of the successes of the program was they brought increased awareness to this complicated issue on Nantucket. There were some shortcomings with the program. They couldn't test everybody who wanted to be tested. And there were about 300 private well owners that were interested who didn't get a chance. The reports that were provided for the testing that residents did receive were a challenge for some people to understand, and there was not a lot of follow-up guidance included. Some people thought that non-detect meant that their water was PFAS-free, and that's not exactly true. And of course, in the letter that people received in the mail, uh, only six PFAS compounds were really discussed. And if you went through the entire lab report, um, sometimes we found out more. So next slide, please. So, um, because the private well testing was done by Mass DEP, these are public records. And so uh, there was a records request made for them. This is de-identified actual data that we have plotted. And what we found is um, the PFAS-6 that Mass DEP has regulated and is looking for, the level was 3.9, which if you just watch Dr. Kergnan's uh, you know, it was not a very high PFAS exposure level, but that's because you're only looking at those six. If you include PFBS, which is a four chain PFAS, a four carbon chain PFAS, that number gets much higher. And the four carbon chain PFAS is still toxic. So it is not water I would drink, but that compound is not regulated in drinking water in Massachusetts right now. And so if you did not look further into the data, you may not have known. And this is actual data from on island. Next slide, please. So this is more data from on island, different well, also de-identified. The PFAS six numbers are in that red box, right? The the graphical representation of those numbers. So what is regulated is in that red box. And now that is well over what people should be drinking, absolutely. But when you wanna consider what that person's true PFAS load is, 
as a chemist, I want to include the PFAS on the left as well. So we want to talk about all the PFAS, not just some of the PFAS. And we're not the only people that are having this conversation. Next slide, please. So there was actually a study on this, more than one. Uh, some of our collaborators at NRDC did a whole paper on it. What are we testing? What are we seeing? What are we not seeing? And you can see in this depiction of that water glass, right? There are some PFAS that are detected by EPA methods. And then there were more that can be detected by commercial labs, but you know are not detected by the EPA methods that we're using for regulatory work. And then there are even more unmonitored, untested, we're not catching them, PFAS. And PFAS are, you know, nobody drinks just one. They end up in your water and in the environment in a mixture. Next slide, please. So it turns out there's another way to look at the PFAS, not just those EPA methods and not just that other commercial method. These methods get very, very expensive. Uh, there's another collaborator, Dr. Graham Peasley at the University of Notre Dame, who, um, you know, pulls up this slide and he says, now, to do this work, you need a small particle accelerator. And it, it's true, you do. That's the little blue thing. And um, I do not work it myself, but it turns out that um, it's very highly selective and you can get a strong fluorine signal and you can use uh, a fluorine analysis with PIGI, the particle-induced gamma ray emission spectroscopy, um, and use it as a proxy for PFAS. Next slide, please. This has been done before with the firefighter gear, with uh, food packaging, and with makeup, which is why now, if I'm going to cry, I can't wear any mascara. Thank you, Graham. Next slide, please. This method has also been used to look at drinking water. Uh, this was Tom Perkins at The Guardian had asked people to take samples and send them to Eurofin's laboratory and send another sample to uh, Dr. Peasley to have an analysis. That Westfield number there, that's us. Uh, in brand new filters, brand new setup that we spent many millions of dollars to, to set up to filter our drinking water, uh, we were told the water was non-detect. Eurofin's found four parts per trillion of PFAS, but Graham found 36. Next slide, please. Turn it over to Willa, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That's so, I mean, just really amazing to hear. Um, as you know, the, as some of you know, the NLWC is entering its 50th anniversary this year. And as we look forward to another, uh, you know, massive effort, we're really excited to be taking Play, uh, taking part in collaborative efforts like these. Um, and one of the opportunities that this project has allowed us is to bring access to water testing and information uh, that can really be presented in an actionable and meaningful way. Um, the Nantucket PFAS project has been funded in part by the Land and Water Council's Water Fund, as well as the uh, Remain Fund at the Nantucket Community Foundation. And we're hoping that this exciting partnership is going to be able to bring together expertise and additional support from across the country. As of right now, we still have a few slots open for this project. Um, it's a pilot project. We're hoping to have um, a bunch of people contribute and get their wells tested. If you'd like to sign up, you can um, use this QR code, which I'm going to have at the end of the presentation. You can use your camera right on your phone and scan it. And we're also going to have a, a link to this project as well. So feel free to sign up. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to throw it back to Aisha. Thank you. And I will go ahead. And now we have our final presenter, Dr. Lepri. Dr. Lepri is a distinguished surgeon, a general surgeon with over 40 years of practice on Nantucket Island, a Tufts University School of Medicine alumni. He is the inspiration of a book, Island Practice, and runs a significant private practice and engages in tick-borne disease research. Additionally, Dr. Lepri fo founded Addiction Solutions of Nantucket uh, for individuals struggling with opioid, drug, and alcohol addiction. His extensive experience and unwavering dedication to addressing 
critical health challenges within the community make him a notable figure on the island. I also have the honor of calling him my boss. Dr. Lepre, I'll go ahead and pass it on to you. Thank you very much, Aisha. Uh, I would tell you, obviously, you did not save the best for last. Uh, following up on these two scientists is always a, uh, a problem since I had difficulties with inorganic and organic chemistry. But what do I know about PFAS? Well, I know it's a problem. It's largely undiagnosed and it's unappreciated as a significant problem. Now, my story begins with a young fireman that had a testicular cancer. He was treated, he was cured. But then I sp started speaking to Aisha and she brought up the article about PFAS. So I started looking into it and I found it very, very interesting. The next thing that happened was my daughter's water turned out to be positive for PFAS and she had three kids. So this became a very interesting problem. Uh, so I got involved and tried to find out what I could. Now, as it's been very clearly brought up, these are fluorinated eternal chemicals of which we really know about a very small fraction. They've been around probably for 80 years, you know, and your nonstick pans, your waterproof clothes, your oil proof clothes, your sticky stuff that you want to unstick uh, on ski wax and <laughs> cosmetics. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, the, the problem is that these, as I noted, are eternal. They are in the water. Uh, they are in the sludge. Uh, recently out the dump, not recently, but within the last five years, the dump was giving out compost that had uh, a tremendous load of PFAS in it. So this is a real problem. It's a common problem and it's all around us. So what can we do about it? I think it's important that people get their water tested and get tested. Uh, and I think that's a collaborative discussion between a patient and their physician. Why collaborative? Because it's not like we discuss your appendix. That can come out and that's the end of that problem. With PFAS testing and testing your water, um, it raises a series of problems. <clears throat> For example, if your well is contaminated, it might be a little more difficult to sell the property. Uh, and if I tell you what your level is, you're going to say, okay, now what? And I'll have to say, well, there is no what in that what. Uh, we don't quite know what to do. Uh, as mentioned, the levels of PFAS uh, give us an indication of potential problems. Uh, but they don't mean that a particular individual with an elevated uh, PFAS level in their blood will incur any one of those problems that were mentioned earlier. Also, as was just mentioned, we really don't know about the other PFASs or other fluorinated uh, chemicals that are right now not detectable. Uh, so that raises another set of issues. So it has to be a collaborative discussion. Uh, I'll tell you that I think one important thing would be to find out if you had a very high level, because then it could alert your physician uh, to be more aggressive in testing. Certainly most of the tests are routine tests uh, that we do. I do a million Medicare wellness uh, checks every year. 
uh, two or three a day. And those are the regular bloods that we draw, but there are other examinations uh, that could be done if you know that you have a particularly high level. I think it's important to get the water checked. Why? Because the best way to avoid uh, ingesting PFAS is to make sure your water doesn't have it. Uh, then perhaps go buy a nice cast iron frying pan. And perhaps you don't need the waterproof jacket. And perhaps I'll leave it up to the women on the board, whether you need cosmetics or a ski wax. Uh, you, the important thing is to avoid getting more PFAS. We all have it, but we don't need more of it. This was one of my arguments around the turf field. I was assured by the people that wanted to put in the turf field that there would be minimal dispersion of uh, PFAS. But there's Trump, when I asked them, I said, well, does that mean we should do this? We should get the turf field because we don't have enough PFAS? Um, and they didn't have a particularly good answer for that question. So we have to avoid it. And avoided is uh, behavior behavior, looking at what your risks are and avoiding opportunities of uh, getting exposed to PFAS that you don't need to. The also, you may, knowing a level, may direct further clinical evaluations. I mean, there are the routine blood tests, but you can anticipate certain things and uh, be after it. We talked about, it was mentioned that if you have a very low level, you maybe have nothing to worry about. But in a way, I think about it as, A, we don't know that you really have a low level. It just means if we test for certain ones and we don't find them, that's great, but there may be other ones. And I'm not sure there's a, a, a safe level any more than there's a safe level of radiation. Uh, there really isn't. You know, we have to think before we do x-rays and particularly doing CAT scans. You know, everybody that stubs their toe wants a CAT scan, but there's a tremendous amount of radiation there. So I think, and be very careful about what are acceptable numbers. So we really don't know what the real spectrum of potential problems are and who is apt to get it but it's a discussion you should have with your physician and you have to control your exposure. I think it is important to think uh, that there are things you can do. You can filter your water, which will reduce some of them. Uh, you could go on town water, which is probably a very safe approach. Uh, but the other thing you can do is become politically active. Uh, if you're politically active, you can maybe press the government at whichever level, at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level to improve uh, ways to deal with this and to avoid further contamination. So since we don't know that, I think a collaborative discussion with your physician on testing, why would you want to be tested? Do you have a particular exposure? I mean, it's interesting. When I look at medical records, I don't often see under the social history, they say somebody has been working, but they don't say what type of work or, uh, and from that you could glean an exposure risk. So I think it's important to do that. I think it's important to be politically active and I think that this is going to play out over the next five or 10 years that we'll get better answers in controlling our exposure to PFAS, what the potential problems that are coming up and how to deal with those and uh, make our water and our lives a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to give a big thank you to all of our presenters tonight. I think I speak for us all when I say it's uh, so heartening to know that there's such dedicated and intelligent people who are dedicating their time to this. Um, I really 
appreciate you all being here and, and to the participants, to everybody watching tonight, I appreciate it as well. Um, we're going to move on to a Q&A session. Um, on the screen right now, I just wanted to draw attention to a lot of the collaborators that we had here tonight. Um, and again, this is the QR code <laughs> for the, the PFAS pilot whale project. So if you wanna sign up, you can use that. If you just open your phone and use the camera, it should bring you to a link. Um, and if you have any other questions that you don't wanna voice right now, you can also reach out to this email on the bottom of the screen. Um, if you do have a question, you can use the raised hand feature and I can call on you. Um, or you can put it in the chat and I will try and voice that as well. So I put in the chat um, that I was really sorry to have missed. Um, I had a slide that was missing and you might've saw me stumble at the beginning and that was why, because I was like, this is weird. This isn't how I usually start. So I put it in the chat, the slide, and that shows some of the different products that PFASs are used in. And, you know, can really rattle those lists off and have in my head all the, you know, how much exposure I think we get from each different one. So if you have questions about that, I'm happy to, happy to answer it. You know, I think when I first started working on this, it was being used as like a, oh, well, it's in microwave popcorn bag. So it was sort of used as like, a, so it must be safe was the implication. And so I'd have to stand up in community and say, you know, actually we're, we are concerned about these exposures. They've been phased out for a reason. And, um, you know, it's it, they're not in there because we think they're safe and, and just not to um, let that be a source of confusion. Somebody has a question, Susan? Hi, um, it's sort of a question, it's a concern. So I, I've been involved in the hyenas PFAS study. Um, I have not, I mean, I lived on Nantucket for 50 years and I didn't live near the airport. So I don't know. And I had, a, I did have a well on the island, but um, not for 50 years. Um, but I lived in hyenas for 20 years and I don't live near the firefighting place that they're having the issue over um, where they, you know, Mary Dunn Road. I don't know. You must probably, some of you know about that. Um, <clears throat> I have stopped using floss because floss has PFAs on it. I've been filtering my water for years, although it's not a water filter that takes out PFAS. Um, I, I rarely use a nonstick pan and the only one I did have I threw out and I used my old iron skillet. Thank you, Tim. Um, anyway, I had my results done and I am my, I'm like, higher than 95%. I'm in the 95 percentile of, they tested for seven different ones. And I just can't believe that, um, I mean, I just can't believe that I have that in my system when I really have lived a fairly non-exposed life. So it's really, um, it's really making me nervous. And I, I brought it to the attention of my, um, doctor and she wasn't too concerned but now with this discussion here and I quickly while we were talking I did I did I entered all my um, blood results into the the um, uh, thing that you had su suggested and I got the exact same result <laughs> so um, in the what's my exposure thing at the PFAS exchange and I got the exact same result because the numbers add up, you know, you add up all the numbers and that's what you get. So I've got the same result there. So that wasn't good. Um, I've done research. I hope I'm not going on too long. I've done research on how to lower the PFAS. One unbelievable thing is to donate blood. Isn't that, do you know about that? I mean, donating blood gets, lowers your PFAS. And, I mean, and then do they come back? <laughs> that's a good question actually. Tim? <laughs> well, I don't think it's practical to bleed you. No, 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 not just on a normal, you know, every six, you know, eight weeks or whatever. But I suspect it's in your tissues also. So it's not yeah. gonna particularly help just to bleed you. Uh, otherwise, massive transfusions would be feasible, but it really isn't. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't sign up at the blood bank. Well, I do donate blood, but not very often. Um, 
I've also read that some pro doing probiotics, particularly lactobacillus, um, is can help. Uh, it seems to be tied to cholesterol. Um, it, there's a cholesterol lowering drug that helps to excrete them, um, and also taking um, like fish oils and omega threes also have shown some some uh, help in that. And I do those things anyway. Um, I do at some point want to get my blood retested again. But I mean, do you- Susan, I would yeah. wonder if you were taking fish oil, it's probably cold water fish and well, they're up at the top of the food chain. So they probably- Right, they have PFAS, fish have, I actually, I don't do fish oil. I do different a different omega three, but um, but that's a good point. People think they're doing a really good thing by eating fish, and now that's become an issue. All right, I don't want to take up all the time. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we just and had so, a. Oh, I was just going to say, Susan, I dropped in a link that you can share with your doctor. Um. It's continuing med medical education points um, that they can get. And it's just a link that goes over PFAS and general synopsis. There's also, I can share another link that you can share um, with your doctor as well, um, a fact sheet. Okay. That would be great. Do you, can you email that? Because um, you have my email from signing up for this. Is that possible? Yes, I can. I, I can email it all to you. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe to everyone. Maybe, you know, that would be might be helpful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we just had a question in the chat asking if we we're still looking for participants for our, our well testing project. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity to encourage um, more participation if possible. Um, the well sampling that we are conducting with samples from private wells is, is utilizing Dr. Peasley's method that Kristen had spoken about, um, which screens for fluorinated compounds and can serve as a, a screening for all PFAS compounds. This method is, is much more affordable than those that are currently recognized by state and federal agencies. So it's a great opportunity. Um, and as a part of this project, we're providing these tests for free. So really it's, it's a great time to, to look into this. Um, and we're hoping that this project will provide additional information to Nantucket residents and will also serve to support the formal adoption of Dr. Peasley's method so that this can be spread elsewhere and will become a more accessible method for people across the country. Um, so please feel free to, to use that QR code and we're, we'll send out some resources as we move through this, uh, uh, maybe with Aisha's uh, contributions here in the chat and, and some other things as well. Um, it looks like David has a hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Um, I don't know if it's not so much as a question, but I happen to be the director for the town of Nantucket sewer department. Um, so PFAS is a lot of my life. Um, we have now been testing our wastewater for, we're just getting ready to start year two on testing. So we have been doing some real um, intensive testing um, through across the island. And the results we're seeing are, you know, are coincide with what you guys are seeing. Um, we know which two of our our uh, sources are and what who has the highest numbers, um, which has been a rather interesting. And we we did the testing um, in my former life. I was a, a plumbing contractor on the island, so we wanted to try to test specifically around two times of the. Yeah, which was in the April area and then the November area. And the reason that we did that specifically was we knew that's when people's houses were getting turned on and people's houses were getting turned off for the season. And we did see um, very high numbers of um, PFAX industrial cleaner. Um, I, it's quite long on the code. Um, but we do. We we have tested our leachate. We tested our um, all of our pump stations. We test all of our haulers, uh, septic haulers, carpet cleaners, etc. So we also have some pretty significant data. And I have spoken to this with about this with Tim um, and Asia in, in depth. Um, so 
we're on the other side of it, not only the water for the well part of it, but we're on the other side of it. What, how much is in our wastewater? And now this year, as far as part, as part of phase two, we're gonna start to go dig deeper. We're gonna start to go manholes so we can do neighborhoods to see if we can find hot neighborhoods or, or hot, higher level number in our neighborhoods. Um, so we, we, we're pretty active out here. Um, we've spoken at different seminars and, and everything about it. So uh, I'm in constant contact with Aisha <laughs> all the time. So she, uh, she keeps me on the know and uh, we worked, I've worked with Emily for many, many years. So I just wanted you guys to, to know that we're testing the other end of it as well. Thank you so much for that contribution. That's great to hear a different perspective on it and, and know that there's a lot going on uh, across the board. Um, I have another question from the chat here. Uh, it's sort of concerning the airport and the digging up that's going on. So they're going to dig up the dirt for the concrete parking area and put it in a lined berm with ventilation. I'm concerned about this. I'd like to know if it's possible to keep the PFA contaminated soil contained. Um, is digging it up going to reintroduce PFAS into the wells? I happen to know a little bit about that. Um, it is going to be in a lined area, um, so it's not going to have any direct contact with the, uh, the soils um, to protect any further um, contamination. Um, the only reason I know a lot of this is because we also handle all the stormwater on Nantucket. So um, we're involved deeply. Um, we always tend to watch um, any applications that come in for um, uh, any stormwater activity, any major commercial developments or stuff like that. So we're always reviewing plans to see where, um, where they are, if they're in a well protection, wellhead protection zone, et cetera. And then we require, we're starting to require more and more testing for that. So the airport has its own um, LSP on site and they're very, very involved with the whole process going on out there. So it's not a hundred percent stop gap, but it's, they're doing everything they can out there. Um, I hope that helps a little bit. Emily, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Or is it a different question? Um, thank you, Willa. No, I actually was going to just add something and um, thanks for that um, piece, David, as well. And it certainly is really great to know how much you guys are doing out there at the sewer department. And I know the town has really been focusing on the PFAS issue. Um, I, prior to this forum, was actually on, as maybe some others uh, in the audience, an airport commission meeting where there was an agenda item about the current um, expansion project that's underway. And actually one of the questions that I posed to the um, airport folks and their consultants was exactly that, which was about um, the some of the potentially contaminated soil being locked up um, in this enclosed noise berm uh, that they're going to use geotextile material to contain. And um, I certainly asked the question about ongoing monitoring of that and um, trying to maintain it into the future. And the consultant did speak about doing some more research on how monitoring is conducted when this sort of thing is done to close out old landfills um, and talked about getting back um, with some more information. So stay tuned. That's certainly something that we're concerned about um, and going to continue to investigate as well. Thank you so much. Um, I have one more question I, I, that's come up in the chat. It's just somebody asking if there's any filters that are recommended. Um, I'll throw that to the panel, see if there's anything. I'm not an expert, but I think the reverse osmosis is the uh, most effective. And uh, you guys can, it's David again, and you guys can excuse me for talking too much, but um, I know that um, carbon 
has been used in a lot of uh, filters, the point of entry filters, the POEs, they call them, or poets. And um, over in Barnstable specifically, and because I, I, Susan had brought that up, um, Barnstable, they've been pumping groundwater for years now, going through carbon filters um, over there. And one of the problems with carbon filters is it becomes a hazmat material and then just th then to get rid of it becomes another issue so um it's just something else that I, i've learned over the years i've got to know pfas too well um i did recently even talk to tim about um getting tested myself for pfas because we handle a lot of pfas products in what we do as, as in our jobs from handling leachate landfill leachate carpet cleaner waste um and those are two of our highest contributors for PFAS. So just think of everyone's furniture and the Scotch guard that's on there, your furniture and your, your carpets. So I just, I'll, be, I'll be quiet for a while now. <laughs> no, that's great. I just put a link into the chat of my favorite fact sheet that I like to share um, with people in my studies around filters. Um, I'm sure there's a better link out there that's actually direct to the <laughs> website I originally got this from. Um, but this is just what I have handy. So it talks about the different types of filters a little bit, um, you know, showing that the reverse osmosis, you know, they did do a study and showed that that did remove more of the PFAS. There's several studies now that show that when you have a mixture like AFFF, you probably do want to go with a reverse osmosis filter. Um, but really you need to be sort of testing it. What can happen over time with granular activated carbon or a reverse osmosis as you can get breakthrough over time. Um, and so, sorry, my daughter is very sick. I need to put her to bed. But um, basically it will over time break through like the carbon becomes saturated um, and then the PFASs will start to break through. And when the saturation occurs, actually they can break through all at once and you get a big pulsing. Um, and I think something similar can happen with reverse osmosis as well. So, you know, we're making sure to test um, usually there's people working with communities like, like yours that would help you, you know, get the right filters and test. But, you know, we academics also tend to get involved when, uh, to, to help answer these kinds of questions. Um, so I hope that that's useful. I, I also wanted to note it. My mom lives in a PFAS impacted area and, um, so is my brother. That's how I kind of got involved, but there's some products there's one product in particular out there that acts like references this study and says and like makes all these misleading claims and my mom had sent me that filter and i know the author of this study so i emailed her and she was like no they're mis like they're they are, yeah you're right they're misrepresenting our study and what we found um so their filter is not reverse osmosis so buyer beware um you know, know the difference. And, and when you're buying a filter, ask these kinds of questions. And if it doesn't say it's reverse osmosis, it, it probably isn't. That's my soapbox. I'm done. Um, I just wanted to add to Dr. Kerrigan's um, part about the filters, um, NSF certified or the filters typically like th that you'll want to get. I think she put a link to a lot of the filters. <laughs> um, and then there is the issue with Carbon filters are great. Any kind of filter is great, but it depends. You know, a lot of times these shorter chain PFAS will not be picked up by the carbon filters. And that's where you'll perhaps want to look into a reverse osmosis, perhaps um, maybe not doing a full home, anything like that, just a simple under the sink that can really um, help a lot because they aren't the most efficient. They'll, you know, I think it's like every three gallons of water, you get one gallon of good water. It's it's so it's not it's not something you don't want to lower your water pressure and maybe not the best choice uh, for your whole, full home. And then the other thing um to point out and Dr. Lepper, you'll know that the that disease that it's I forget the name of it. Um when you you don't want to have you don't want to be hooked up to town water and put a full home reverse osmosis. If if you ever do want to have that, you'll want to do it under the sink. But if you do the whole home hooked up to town water or municipal water, it it takes out all the chemicals. I forget what that that's called, but that can lead to further issues um, with the pipes. It's somebody's name. I forget what it's called, but um, you'll kind of want to avoid that one. 
I assure you mean Legionnaires. Yes, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, and I just have to say, I mean, even from your your attending audience, absolutely stellar information. Uh, the only thing that I would add um, is also uh, that in some places, if you are on septic, particularly in Massachusetts, um, there can be an issue with how uh, you set up the waste for your filters. So just make sure that, you know, you educate yourself on how to do that properly. Um, and otherwise, everything everyone has said is exactly true. The whole house filters um, can remove the disinfectants and the stabilizers that municipal water supplies put into that water. And that's why I should just was just warning you to use a point of use instead of a point of entry. Um, if you have other things in your water that require a point of entry, you know, you need to take care to make sure that your pipes are okay. Um, but uh, beyond that, yeah, anything you can do to reduce your numbers is a good start. Um, and the absolute best you can do is reverse osmosis. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna see if there's any more questions. Oh, could you speak to the essential use concept? Anyone? This would be towards Dr. Kerrigan. Okay, I was wondering, um, I'm sure Kristen could answer it too. Um, but the essential use concept is um, really has to do with our chemical policy and the way that it's a little bit backwards. Um, you know, when you have a drug, like a pharmaceutical drug, you need it to be tested um, and proven to be safe before it can be used. And, you know, like I mentioned, that that um, isn't true for all of the chemicals that are in our products. Uh, I think most people assume that they're tested that way. And, and bottom line is that they aren't when it comes to chronic disease and illness. So um, with PFAS is, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that the legacy PFAS that were found to be harmful were then, you know, phased out of use and, and other PFAS started being used before any, you know, and sufficient testing was done to show that they're safe. So we call this regrettable substitution, this idea that, you know, this happens with lots of other chemical classes I've worked on. It's happened with flame retardants and phthalates and bisphenols, and it's very frustrating. Uh, it certainly keeps us busy, but um, I honestly rather do other things than uh, continue to do uh, work on this kind of problem that doesn't seem to end. So the idea is that the, um, essential use is saying, you know, when we know a chemical is harmful, and there's so many, it's like impossible to test them all for safety. And this kind of substitution is being done. We can say something like, well, let's only use them when they're essential, right? <laughs> essential use. Let's just try to stop using them in things that are not essential, or even make laws to say that they can't be used in, in things unless they are essential. And of course, I think that's happening to you right now. Um, and of course, industry is saying that they're all essential. I mean, it's, it's very profitable for them to use them. Um, but, you know, this is one way to try to come at this question of, you know, do we really need these, this class of chemicals and all of these things? And, you know, if we don't know that they're safe, um, let's not expose the entire population while we try to figure that out, um, right? I've been working on these for a decade. It's, it's been over 10 years that they've been phased out, the legacy PFASs. And you know my daughter's five, so it's it's very frustrating. So I would just add um, that, especially uh, you know in in places where COVID is really high, it, PFAS is used in everything that protects you know me from catching any kind of disease, protects your doctors, protects your surgeons. Um, it, it's, it's, it's use is so ubiquitous that it's more difficult to think of the things that have no PFAS in them than it is to think of things that have PFAS. So when we talk about essential use, there are still a lot of essential uses. There are also a lot of uses for you know nuclear chemistry, but we're very, very careful with them. Right. I mean, there there are medical uses for nuclear chemistry, but we're very careful with them um, with respect to the firefighting foam. You know, the same industries that helped create it, helped 
write the rules that required we use it and helped write the regulations that kept that use in place. So we really need to make sure that we, uh, the people, right, that that elect the governing bodies, make sure that, you know, our governing bodies and our regulators know what's happening, um, which also means that when things are happening, we can't just ignore it and not address the situation or assess the situation. Uh, you know, we need to be taking some numbers and taking some tests and 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 taking a look at what we really need to be using these for. If we need them to protect our medical providers to make sure that everyone doesn't get sick at the same time, then okay. But what do we do with them when they're done? Do we need to incinerate them and put PFAS in the air? Maybe not. Maybe we need to think of different methods of containment and then disposal. Maybe we need to you know, stop producing it where we don't need it and then stop converting it where we can stop converting it and encapsulate until we can find safe destruction methods. I have um, another question in the chat, just asking if we could please speak about the town's new requirements for well testing for home sales. Um, I'd be happy to to touch on that, and I don't have all of the exact details in front of me, but the um, Board of Health, I think it was at the end of last summer, maybe it was around September or so, um, they reviewed, they had proposed some changes to uh, the uh, private well regulations here on Nantucket locally and um, have implemented some additional requirements for private well sampling for PFAS under a number of um, circumstances, including the transfer of a property so that when um, a home is sold and is being purchased, there's a requirement to actually sample the well for PFAS before that transaction takes place. I imagine that that is um, specifically focused around the those PFAS compounds that are currently regulated in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and again, I don't have all the, the uh, details of that in front of me, but um, it is the the Board of Health has um, implemented some changes um, in that area just recently. Thank you, Emily. Um, another question in the chat just came up. Uh, if somebody is on town water, can they get their water tested? Does it make sense to do it? Um, I can speak right now. The pilot project uh, the the pilot well testing project is is just for private wells right now, um, but perhaps uh, some of our panelists might have any uh, other information on this question. The data nerd in the group would love to see what the town water looks like with this test as well. So I'm just saying it's a good idea. Uh. I know that the um, I mean the. Our local uh, public water supply, the Wanakamet Water Company, they they certainly are doing regular testing again for those PFAS compounds that are regulated um, uh, and reviewed by the state. I think that that's currently the regimen that they're on. Thank you. Um, will the results that are done by the DPW be available to the public? David, are you still with us? If you are, I think there's some interest in finding out whether the work you guys are doing on wastewater will be public. Yes, it's currently being um, put into a, a form that the general public can understand. Um, I mean, anyone can look at raw data and I know the sci scientists people amongst us Anyone can look at raw data and come up with a few different answers. Um, but uh, ours is, and that was a fear of mine to get raw data out that couldn't be interpreted um, clearly. So it will be coming out, yes. And David, while you're on, do you happen to know any additional details about the Board of Health's recent regulatory changes or? I, I do know that I guess I thought I had heard it was any home sale, not just well um, P 
people on wells, but, um, and the more you test for it, the more you're going to find it. There's no doubt. Um, and that's why we are continuing with year two on our testing because we're trying to find out where it is. That's why we're going down to the micro level now to check neighborhoods and areas. So, Thank you. Uh, I re really appreciate that insight. Um... I'm going to see, is this, are, are there any other, oh, Emily? Um, I just was going back and referring to the um, Board of Health regs that changed, and it was specifically the private well regulations that, at least that I'm aware of, that, that um, those changes were made too. So I think it was targeted at um, homes that have private wells. But it's still um, really, I, I think, a great change, and I'm really glad the Board of Health has put that in there. All right. Um, am I? Are there any other questions in the in the room right now? Before we think we're beginning to wrap it up here, I'll give everybody a second to think. Before that, uh, I just want to give a huge thank you to everybody one more time. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Lepre, Dr. Kerrigan, Ms. Mello. Thank you so much for your your insights here. It's really amazing to hear you all. Um, and thank you to all the participants and all the great questions that we received tonight. It's a great conversation to be had. Not always easy, but really important to start a dialogue about this and, and your engagement means a lot. I just wanted to offer something up too. I know um, because this is recorded and it's public, there may be people who have questions um, that they don't want to publicly ask. Um, so our emails are available and there's contact us pages. Uh, if you have any questions privately that you want to ask, feel free to ask us or we can always get in touch with Ms. Mello or Dr. Kerrigan and ask them more in depth. Um, I know also that there were some people who had their blood levels and their well water test and they wanted to speak a little bit more in detail with someone. Um, and that's something we could also set up. I, you know, it's um, definitely everyone's giving up their time, but it's an important topic. And I think everyone's really wanting to help um, everyone understand it as much. So if there is anyone who has those questions, they can always reach out to, you know, anyone from the land council or, or um, you know, uh, or PFAS action group as well. And um, also with, with Dr. Kerrigan, we can always set something up where your information shared can go under, um, it's a, like a research type of situation. So it's completely private and no one else would uh, know about what was discussed. And I think Veronica, your hand was up. Do you, okay. do you have a question, Veronica? Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not Veronica. I'm next to her. <laughs> <laughs> um, the we jumped in late, so the powerpoints and the other information will, is that going to be available on on any of your websites, whether the Water Council or somewhere. Yeah, so this whole presentation has been recorded from start to finish. I'm sorry for anybody who had trouble jumping on in the beginning there. And we had a couple technical difficulties, but we're going to post the entire presentation on the Land and Water Council's website. Um, and we'll be sharing links to that. Okay, no, thank you. I just want to be able to catch all the stuff so that I missed the beginning. So thank hey, you. Thank you for your engagement. All right, well, I guess with that, we will wrap this up. And yep, yeah, again, this will all be posted. Thank you everybody for your engagement throughout this entire presentation. Thank you to our presenters. This has been a, a great dialogue to start. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to the, uh, the email that was on that last slide. I can share that again. Please feel free to sign up for the well testing project if you haven't already. Um, we're, we still have a few slots open, so you can definitely take part in that. Um, and thank you again to everybody for, for your continued engagement throughout this entire night. Thank you. Thank you for everyone joining in. Thanks. Stay safe and stay warm. Thanks.
Thanks for having me.